Okay, hello everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us today for this um, tile seminar. I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Lorna Hamilton to you. She is an associate professor at York St. John um, University, where she's also associate head of the School for Psychology. Her research focuses on contextual factors that influence educational outcomes and well being for neurodivergent children and young people. Her PhD examined the role of the home literacy environment and in the reading and um, language development of children with dyslexia and or developmental language disorder. More recently, Lorna's work has explored how educational environments can facilitate or constrain learning for autistic and neurodivergent pupils through school and into higher education. She works in close partnership with schools and local authorities to translate research findings into educational practice. And with that, she really fits really well with our TILE seminar and our mission at TILE. So I'm going to hand over to Lorna. I'm going to unshare my screen here for, for now. And uh, yeah, just hand over again, as always, feel free to post any comments um, or any questions you have in the chat, and then we will answer them and Lorna will answer and address them at the end. Right. So, hello. Um, it's lovely to be here. Um, thank you so much, Carolina, for that kind introduction. I'm just going to take a moment to work out sharing my screen. Um, Carolina, can you just confirm whether you can see the slides? So, right now, I see the one where uh, the presenter mode. So we right. Okay. Let's yep. try the other one. Is that better? Yes. Excellent. OK, um, so uh, hello and um, thanks so much to Carolina for organising this seminar and thank you to you for coming along. Um, so I'm going to be talking about designing education for neurodiversity, uh, a topic which is at the intersection of my research and teaching practice. Um, and specifically, I'd like to consider how universities could create the right environments for neurodivergent students to flourish. Um, I will give a disclaimer from the start. I definitely don't have all the answers and my own practice is very much a work in progress. Um, so I'll be offering reflections based on some ongoing research with neurodivergent secondary school pupils and thinking about how the educational history of neurodivergent students might impact their experiences when they reach university. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about an ongoing experiment in neurodiversity affirmative practice within a module I'm currently teaching. I'm really looking forward to your input, to your thoughts and questions at the end of the talk. Right. There we go, that's moving on. Um, actually, I had totally forgotten what I'd written in my bio for Carolina some month, months ago. So I was going to tell you a little bit about me, but actually Carolina's done an excellent job uh, in uh, the introduction. So I will keep this very brief. But I think it's really important when you're talking about neurodiversity in, in particular to um, make clear your positionality in re relation to that topic. So um, I'm a developmental psychologist by background. Uh, like many, I came to psychology as a mature student, having previously studied and worked in language and music teaching. I was fortunate enough to study for my PhD as part of a large scale longitudinal study of dyslexia and DLD, the developmental language disorder at the University of York, uh, called the Welcome Language and Reading Project. So that's me uh, practicing a standardized test of language on the left there with my uh, two-year-old son, who's now 17 and six foot three. Um, like many researchers in this field, my original interest in neurodivergent developmental trajectories stemmed from personal and family experiences of this type of difference. So the, the welcome study was underpinned by a dominant model of neurodevelopment, uh, Frith and Morton's causal modeling. So the rationale of that framework is to pinpoint specific causes at different levels of explanation, uh, biological cognitive causes in interaction with environmental factors that can explain the behavioral differences seen in dyslexic children, autistic children, ADHD, children with ADHD over developmental time. And there have been some notable successes of that approach. So for example, the broad consensus that phonological processing differences uh, underpin the majority of cases of dyslexia has led to evidence-based interventions and a transformation in the way that reading is taught in schools. 
early speech and language therapy designed around specific difficulties with grammar and verbal memory and so on can be transformative for children with developmental language disorder. However, there are also problems with it. So first, um, these diagnostic categories are fuzzy and there's huge individual variation between children who might have the same diagnosis. So for example, attempts to develop a convincing cognitive level causal explanation of autism have not been successful and have sometimes increased stigma and discrimination. So for example, the discredited idea that autistic people lack empathy. So simple group level causal explanations just really don't cut it. Also in this framework, the role of contextual factors and the specifics of the individual child's strengths and challenges are definitely underplayed. So in my role in the Welcome Project, which I worked on for about five years, six years, I had the privilege to work closely with a group of children and families over, over a long period of time. And what I found fascinating was the individual children's stories and the context in which they developed. My PhD focused on family and socioeconomic factors in development, and I was really struck by the variation in the children's experiences at school. So some experienced nurturing teachers and accepting primary school environments, while for others, even at the young ages that we were working with, between three and nine years old, the repeated experience of feeling less than or a failure at school was already impacting self-esteem and their attitude to learning. So since moving to York St John, where I'm now the head of department for psychology, my research has taken a bit of a qualitative turn um, and I'm working with neurodivergent children, young people, their families and teachers to try to understand individual educational experiences with the aim of informing neurodiversity affirmative educational practice. In the STEPS project, for example, we're using creative methods with multiply neurodivergent pupils as they make the transition from primary into secondary school. And meanwhile, in my other role, as um, our psychology department continues to grow apace, we're seeing more and more neurodivergent students on our undergraduate programs or training to be psychologists in our professional doctorate pathways. This is fantastic to see, and it's really made me reflect on how well my own teaching practice and university institutional culture more broadly support the neurodivergent members of our academic community. So in the time that we've got this afternoon, um, what I'd like to try and do is give a brief overview of the neurodiversity paradigm, its, its roots and how it's um, having really a, quite a sizable impact in the field of developmental science and cognitive science. Um, I'd like to draw briefly on some of the insights from the studies we've run with autistic and neurodivergent school pupils and their experiences. And then I'd like to think about the implications of those experiences for higher education. So what happens when these children um, when those of them who do reach university. And then I'll finish with an ongoing experiment where I'm trying to uh, practice uh, what I preach in facilitating neurodiversity affirmative education in a, in a new level six module. So that's an undergraduate third year module within our psychology uh, degrees here at York St. John. Okay, um, so neurodiversity is one of those terms that is everywhere at the moment and uh, there's certainly ongoing debate about its conceptualization, uh, its, uh, the, what it includes, what it doesn't include. Um, the term was co coined by Judy Singer, um, an autistic sociologist, and it's really a population level term. So it refers to the naturally occurring variation in human neurocognitive functioning that's akin to biodiversity in the natural world and so therefore presumably naturally selected for. So it's a non-pathologizing way of conceptualizing difference. It's an inclusive term that encompasses neurotypicality, so the most frequently occurring neurotypes, um, often problematically conceptualized as normal in medical and psychological literatures. Um, it's important not to confound frequency with what's normal. Um, and also a wide range of neurodivergent differences, which are binned for convenience into these diagnostic categories like ADHD, dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, et cetera. And in practice, we know that these labels overlap and they very commonly co-occur. Sometimes with children, it really can be a matter of which um, professional sees them first as to which, um, which diagnostic category um, they end up or label they end up um, getting. So the advance of the neurodiversity paradigm in, in recent years has been spearheaded by neurodivergent scholars and activists. Um, and it can be seen in terms of the broader ontologies of disability. So the conventional medical paradigm of child psychiatry has been the orthodoxy in understanding neurodiversity for decades, which focuses on individual level deficit, diagnosis and intervention. 
The neurodiversity paradigm has its roots in the social model of disability. So neurodivergence is not intrinsically pathological. There is no one normal or healthy type of mind. Difference can become disabling through a poor person environment fit with common environmental barriers, including physical and, and sensory parts of the environment um, and so social and attitudinal factors too, um, including stigma and discrimination. So neurodiversity is subject to the same social dynamics as other forms of diversity, including power and oppression. The paradigm emphasizes participatory approaches over traditional research on, um, especially in relation to setting the research agenda for autism, ADHD and other con uh, conditions. So there's a move away from trying to pinpoint causes to conducting research that can impact on improved well-being, quality of life and inclusive um, environments for neurodivergent people. The neurodiversity paradigm has its origins in activism of the autism rights movement from sort of the 80s, 90s onwards, but it's increasingly impacting scientific research as well. And I'll just highlight two excellent recent um, conceptual papers that set out really strong arguments for the necessity of a shift towards a neurodiversity model in research. And um, there's a reference list at the end, so I'm sure Carolina will um, change, uh, share the slides and you can uh, look these up if you're interested. Um, so Pelicano and Den Hooting's annual research review um, called Shifting from Normal Science to Neurodiversity in Autism Science um, highlights some of the key problems with the medical model and calls for a paradigm shift in the autism research field. So one problem is an over-focus on identifying individual impairments and functional deficits, drawing attention away from the strengths that accompany neurodivergent differences. Um, often research that on the surface shows that autistic people outperform non-autistic people in certain tasks is often kind of interpreted through this convoluted deficit lens. So for example, a study that shows that uh, enhanced detail processing in autism can be interpreted as a failure to see the big picture. Um, so this kind of research can lead to an implicit goal to make autistic people less autistic and uh, therefore it perpetuates stigma. A second problem is it, it's a highly individualistic perspective that focuses attention away from social and environmental factors that shape people's lives. Contexts in which difficulties occur, so the home, school, university, work, the wider community are, are ignored, and therefore interventions to improve or adapt those contexts are missing from the literature. And thirdly, it's an overly narrow perspective. So it minimizes autistic people's own understanding of autism and their lived experiences. And a lack of attention to first person accounts where data is often collected from parents or teachers or um, researchers of observations means that we miss um, so much of the richness and well, we should be asking autistic people um, about their experiences basically. Uh, Manalili and colleagues uh, recently published a piece in cognitive science called From Puzzle to Progress, how engaging with neurodiversity can improve cognitive science. And similarly to Pelicano and Den Hooting, um, it critiques the broader cognitive science field for conceptualizing neurodiversity as a categorical abnormality. So often cognitive science studies will exclude uh, neurodivergent people altogether from a scientific study on the, brain, on the basis of them being outliers. So uh, participants will um, uh, be um, explicitly neurotypical and autistic or dyslexic people were excluded. Um, so the authors set out a number of reasons for a broader engagement with neurodiversity, so including ethical, so um, this kind of research really others neurodivergence as abnormal, um, working towards better science, so better models of human neurocognitive function will include all neuro neurotypes and the, and the broad variation of um, thinking, reasoning, uh, language and so on that we see, and epistemic judge justice, so allowing neurodivergent scientists' contributions to knowledge to be heard. So I'm borrowing the title of this slide from an excellent recent conference on neuro neurodiversity hosted in Edinburgh last month, uh, which really exemplified a co-produced and strength-based approach. Research is increasingly converging on the benefits of cognitive diversity for group problem solving, specifically complex and creative problem solving. Having people who think differently from each other working together has clear benefits for organizations and society. But unfortunately, there's now a lot of evidence to indicate educational contexts are often aversive for neurodivergent students, which means that fewer of them reach those employment situations where their skills could be recognized and used. 
um, than should be the case. It, this is perhaps particularly true in secondary school environments where inflexible routines, busy physical and social environments and rigid disciplinary policies can disproportionately disadvantage neurodivergent students. So I'm going to draw on um, some of the insights from a qualitative longitudinal study that we conducted with 15 autistic young people as they progressed from the last year of mainstream primary school through the first three years of secondary education. So that's from about age um, 10 to um, age 14. The project came about through the specialist autism teaching team at our local um, council who noticed that while the primary to secondary transition was often quite successful in the short term for autistic pupils, with good support mechanisms in place and good communication between primary and secondary settings. Outcomes from year eight onwards were often much more mixed with high levels of exclusion and therefore more demand for specialist schools and um, spaces. So we work with 15 young people, their parents and their teachers over periods of four years with the aim of tri triangulating perspectives to understand individual educational experiences and outcomes. We prioritised foregrounding pupils' first-person perspectives as much as possible, although we did learn um, a lot over the course of study about interviewing techniques and different ways of elic eliciting perspectives with the range of um, autistic young people we were working with. The sample included predominantly boys um, coming from a wide range of socioeconomic backgrounds. And while the focus of the study was um, autistic pupils, it's worth not noting that many of the young people were multiply neurodivergent. So there were dual diagnoses of autism and ADHD, language difficulties and physical health conditions as well. So alongside the, in the annual interviews, uh, we took measures of mental health, well-being and bullying. Um, so the project report um, is, is there on the screen and it's linked in the references as well. It's accessible on our university um, website if you're interested. So the headline outcomes of the study were sobering um, and unfortunately in line with the growing evidence base on autistic pupils' educational outcomes. So these were all um, acad academically able um, children um, with uh, clear uh, interests and, and, and specialisms, um, but their experiences at school were, were very mixed. So two of the young people were moved to special school provision following periods of exclusion by year eight, so that was by age 12. Uh, one in particular, um, uh, <laughs> all the way through year seven, you know, teachers, parents said, are doing absolutely fantastic. Are we even sure he's, he's autistic, said one teacher. And by, by the end of that year, um, he, his distress and, and um, behavioural um, outbursts at school had become so severe that, that he, he was moved on to a, a specialist setting. So really, um, really intense masking from that young person. Two thirds of the young people reported bullying at school and that was corroborated by parents. Um, and three of those 10 reported that they were punished at school for retaliating to bullies. For more than half of the children, the difficulties that they were experiencing at school were managed by reducing their timetable, so doing fewer subjects. Um, six of the young people had periods where they felt unable to go to school. Um, and 12 of them reported the development of mental health difficulties or emotional distress during the course of the study. Um, important to note that that was predominantly rep um, reported by parents rather than the young people themselves. So um, a difficult a difficult picture. And through through the interviews, um, the report highlights a number of issues through their school experience that, that we think contributed to some of these outcomes. Uh, and as you might expect, sensory stress in the school environment and difficulties with peers featured prominently throughout. Um, I, um, I will just very quickly zoom in on a, uh, some factors that perhaps have most direct relevance to teachers and educators in reflecting on our own practice. So the learning and teaching experiences at secondary school were um, just marked by very high variation. So huge amounts of, of um, variation of autism awareness between teachers and that, was, that becomes particularly marked at secondary school where children are moving between different subjects, different class settings. There were lots of examples of really good autism inclusive practice, but they tended to be related to individual teachers rather than systemic at a school level. Uh, both children and parents reported that some teachers had uh, low expectations of their ability. So one pupil said they label me as a weird kid and they do treat me differently for it. I can get away with not doing any work because the teacher thinks I have some kind of issue. There was often little flexibility in how a task could get done. So um, 
that could lead to frustration when pupils felt that they were getting things right, but they were getting there in, in a different way, but that was deemed incorrect. And um, specific struggles, for example, with lots of verbal instructions being given all at once. So when people said, she'd tell you what to do like all at once and it would confuse me. I'd remember what the title was, but what's the rest of it again? No time scales being given for tasks. And that was a particularly big issue um, during the pandemic where people were learning um, online, which was the final data collection point for this study um, and sensory issues in the classroom. Uh, there were quite frequent adjustments to the curriculum and sometimes a reduced timetable could be helpful to manage difficulties when it was discussed and agreed with families. But the problems came when subjects were removed from the timetable without discussion. So one parent said um, the school are talking about reducing his curriculum to four to five lessons a day, which I'm a bit concerned about. At primary, he sat next to the teacher and she could keep him in check a bit more. So parents tended to perceive that decisions were made on, on basis of children's behaviour rather than their ability to engage with the subject. Uh, so another parent said in RE and religious education, he was getting on fine, but the teachers were just too strict. So he hasn't done that. French is another one he doesn't do, although he's very good at it, apparently. So sometimes uh, children were not getting access to subjects that could have been areas of strength because um, as a behavioral management technique, really. And very occasionally, I should say, this was not common, but subjects were sometimes judged by uh, a school as unsuitable for autistic pupils as a blanket rule. So the one example I, I, that sticks out was religious ed education. So one uh, school staff member saying, oh, it, that d doesn't work well with autistic pupils because uh, thinking is too literal. And of course, um, there are many examples of excellent autistic uh, philosophers and so on. So that kind of blanket thinking could be really unhelpful. Disciplinary policies within school were um, came up frequently. So young people tended to be highly aware of school rules, keen to follow them, and in fact became very anxious if they saw peers uh, breaking school rules. But behaviour systems um, uh, tended to cause a high level anxiety. So one young person said, once when I was a bit afraid to do a contact sport, I got a bit upset and I couldn't do much. And the teacher gave me a red comment. He's a bit stern. Is that supposed to be the way you treat a kid with autism? This idea of sort of red comments and uh, rewards and, and, and punishments um, uh, could cause a lot of stress and anxiety. And both young people and their parents perceived that the sanctions were often given in response to behaviours that were characteristic of autism. So when uh, people said, in primary, I used to cry. Now when the teacher shouts at me, I always question them. I say, why are you shouting at me? And they say, don't answer back. And then I always get sent out. So again, this idea that sort of curious, curiosity and wanting to know um, the reason for something uh, was, was punishable. And then the last theme I'll hi highlight um, is that the, how autism develops as part of the, uh, an identity through this period of adolescence. So it was very clear that how the young people felt about autistic uh, being autistic changed as they got older. For some, uh, it became more positive, more positive part of their identity, and some they more and more rejected um, the idea of being autistic. And there were some very clear feelings of shame about being autistic. They had to navigate uh, if, when, and how to disclose a diagnosis, and that, that could be really tricky. And they were and often highly aware of the dif different discourses about autism. So, you know, talking about it as, as a deficit and a problem and something that needs to be fixed versus um, a more a, a kinder neurodiversity approach and um, focusing on strengths. Um, uh, so one young person said, for example, uh, they treat me like a cute cat. They treat us like we're not human, like we're less, like we're different, not, like we are different, that's a fact, but they treat us like we're different. And those, that kind of um, awareness of being responded to as, as different all the time often led to masking. So we made some recommendations um, based on uh, uh, these, these studies uh, around teacher, teacher training, universal teacher training with autistic and neurodivergent involvement, particularly around the issue of masking, around um, wider education uh, for the whole community and the, the LEANS project team at Edinburgh University have developed some fantastic resources for this and um, lesson plans on teaching uh, young people about neurodiversity. Around inclusive teaching practices, so supporting verbal instructions with written and chunking and providing time for skills, etc. The importance of consistent teaching assistant and pastoral support, um, so children knowing who they can go to to talk to about things and when. Uh, regularly reviewing behavioural policies for um, equality, diversity, inclusion, and so on, uh, reframing challenging behaviours in the light of uh, neurodivergent traits, uh, avoiding zero, zero tolerance approaches, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we were 
very mindful um, of you know avoiding school blaming because there's excellent work that goes on in school the problem is um around consist uh, consistency or um, it being universal within or between school settings and very mindful of the very significant budgetary and regulatory constraints within school so um plowing through this data and writing these recommendations did lead to a little bit of uh, looking in the mirror and uh, reflecting on my own um practice in the, the university setting and how university settings more generally um, uh, are more or less inclusive for the neurodivergent students that we support. Um, so the neurodivergent uh, school pupils who make it to higher education have already overcome significant and continuous barriers at school. And how well do universities provide contexts that support them to thrive? I mean, they should. Um, universities provide the opportunity to pursue subjects of specialist interest in great depth. They provide greater flexibility over the organization of time in a way that suits the individual needs. Uh, but how well do we actually do it? So um, I think there are a number of um, barriers to higher education that are specific for neurodiverg neurodivergent students. So the first is neuronormative hidden curriculum. So often higher education contexts have implicit rules or expectations of an acceptable student or their behavior. So this might include sitting still and paying attention for a two hour lecture, knowing that critical evaluation of source material is needed, um, participating actively and constructively in group work, writing in a conventional academic style. So some of these um, expectations might can, can be made explicit and scaffolded, but many are not. Um, sometimes different uh, difference in um, Assessment work, for example, can be construed as negative rather than evidence of originality or, or excellence. Um, a second issue is the kind of bolt-on model for disability support services. So certainly in the UK, um, the typical model is that neurodivergent students have to advocate for their needs and navigate a complex system of assessment processes in order to merit accommodation, such as text-to-speech software or extra time in exams. It's not to say that disability services don't provide excellent and compassionate support because they do, but the systems can be complex. Um, this, and that's driven like most things by resource scarcity, but it does have a number of adverse consequences for students. First, they don't receive a formal plan of support until well into their first year of study or beyond often, meaning that the transition to university might be marked by a lack of support or reasonable adjustment. And for some students that can, be too, that can come too late. Second, this, uh, the system of um, uh, going through um, assessment often when they might already have a diagnosis means that students have to foreground their deficits and their support needs in order to access support, which is in conflict with a more holistic, compassionate and neurodiversity informed view of themselves as a student with strengths and difficulties like any other student. Neurodiversity specific learning challenges could include the near total reliance on written forms of assessment for dyslexic students, managing independent study and processing critical feedback for ADHDers, or achieving a sense of belonging in the university community for autistic students. And then finally, the work in schools highlights how many neurodivergent students arrive at university with a negative concept of themselves and education. So cumulative experiences of non-accepting environments at school can have long lasting effects, which contribute to a negative sense of self and reduced well-being and quality of life for older students and adults. So reflecting on these issues, I recently co-authored a paper on how higher education might employ a more compassionate pedagogical approach to support all students, and specifically neurodivergent students, to develop a more positive view of themselves in education. Um, I wrote this with Stephanie Petty, um, who's a clinical psychologist um, and academic with a specialism in neurodiversity affirmative practice, and I draw on her expertise um, in compassion-focused therapy. Concepts of compassionate others, compassionate memories, and compassionate spaces underpin therapeutic practices. So, for example, um, a therapist might explore early experiences where judgments and expectations from others cause a sense of threat um, and harness compassion to soothe the emotional response to those memories. For neurodivergent people, this might include memories from early education of being seen as naughty or stupid, being told they're not behaving like they should, not trying hard enough, or having their failings repeatedly highlighted. They might remember not fitting in at school or not being good enough as they are. And the accumulation of those past experiences encourages masking, which has severe implications for mental health. 
Safe spaces are places where individuals feel a sense of belonging and value with an absence of ne negative judgment. And in a pedagogical rather than a therapeutic context, a compassion inf informed approach would seek to create such spaces of belonging and to act to mitigate structures and practices that disproportionately disadvantage minority, minoritized students, including um, neurodivergent students. This would mean uh, taking a neurodiversity affirmative approach, so not measuring students by neuronormative standards, but allowing flexibility for diverse ways of thinking, perceiving and interacting to find paths to achievement and belonging. So what might a neurodiversity affirming higher education um, classroom look like? Uh, so recently presented um, with my colleague Magda, um, Grosser Hodge um, to the Unconference, um, which is Open Science uh, Conference. Uh, Magda and I both belong, belong to the Thought Network, which is a framework for open and reducible, uh, reproducible research training. If anyone has an interest in open science and uh, teaching open science, it's an absolutely fantastic uh, online community with heaps of resources. I mean, it has a neurodiversity subgroup. Um, so as part of that, uh, we presented on, on uh, how the open science uh, community might embrace neurodiversity. Um, and we identified three key routes to neuro, uh, neurodiversifying the higher education curriculum. So the first is in raising awareness of neurodiversity. So this could involve challenging the deficit focus, acknowledging, for example, that um, restricted interests can, can also mean deep funds of knowledge. A deficit in response inhibition can facilitate fast problem solving. Um, a deficit in sustained attention often comes with strength and creativity and so on. Uh, it can involve uh, including sources by neurodivergent researchers in reading lists um, and the Fort community um, are developing a database of neurodivergent scholars um, and their work, which is great. And creating um, a, a safe environment for disclosure of diagnosis by neurodivergent students and staff. A second pillar would be talking about difference openly and with empathy. So this would include the mindful use of language. So avoiding discriminatory or pathologizing terminology when talking about difference. Um, the number of neurodivergent students I've talked to who have um, talked about how you know they might be a uh, student with ADHD and have talked about you know the, the really stigmatizing way that they've heard ADHD uh, referred to within the curriculum. Um, it could involve asking students about their preferred terminology. These things aren't settled, they evolve um, and acknowledge, uh, acknowledging that there's a variety of opinion. It could involve um, awareness of double empathy bar barriers in the classroom. Um, so double empathy um, problem was described by Damian Milton um, and it challenges the idea of an intrinsic empathy deficit in autism, instead foregrounding the breakdown in reciprocity and mutual understanding that can happen when people have widely differing experiences of the world. So for example, across neurotypes. So an empathy deficit happens in social interaction, not within an individual's cognition. In the classroom, that could include avoiding ascribing a negative intention to a student behavior, such as sitting with eyes closed, not engaging in group work, or not volunteering answers to questions that are routinely posed verbally and on the spot. And the third pillar is delivering um, for a diverse student audience. Um, so uh, designing courses, modules and curricula with diversity in mind from the outset, with cognitive diversity as one dimension of difference alongside others such as gender, racial, socioeconomic and so on. And promising and, um, and compassionate pedagogical approaches in this regard include universal design for learning and strength based approaches. So um, I'm sure many of you know that UDL um, is an approach to curriculum design and learning and teaching that offers flexibility to students in the way that they access materials and demonstrate their learning. It also seeks to harness individual motivators for engagement. It seeks to use a variety of teaching methods in order to remove barriers to learning and facilitate the widest possible range of learners to succeed. Um, it foregrounds multiple means of engagement. So that can mean letting students make choices, giving assessments that feel relevant to their lives, gamifying education, creating opportunities for movement in class. Uh, multiple means of represent representation. So offering information in multiple formats, text, audio, video, hands-on learning, and multiple means of action or expression. 
So providing more than one way to interact with material and demonstrate knowledge. So it could be a choice between a written test, an oral report, making a video and, or doing a group project, for example. So um, probably all of us use some or all of these techniques in our pedagog pedagogical practice as standard. Um, but I reflected um, through my uh, 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 sabbatical semester um, before Christmas that there were definitely uh, areas of, of this that I could go further with and do more. So this semester I decided to go all in for a new third year undergraduate module. And the module is called Neurodiversity and Development. So I figured if I can't do it there, where can I? So this is a core module for the developmental specialist pathway on our BSc psychology degrees. So it has a small class size and the topic um, obviously makes it good testing ground for some of these techniques. And when I was designing the module, um, I had a number of key aims in mind based on the principles of compassionate pedagogy, universal design and neurodiversity affirmative education. So I wanted to um, embed flexibility and choice by design in all aspects of the course. Um, I wanted to try to incorporate co-design, so to involve students in helping me develop the curriculum, in suggesting uh, class activities, um, and in working with me to um, improve their learning experience. I was really keen to try and re reduce assessment anxiety, which I think um, has anecdotally has grown exponentially in recent years, particularly over the pandemic. I wanted to incorporate active learning and get students doing rather than uh, listening to me waffling on and to allow students to harness their individual strengths in order to um, engage with the content and, um, and demonstrate what they've learned. So to do this, um, uh, th there were several steps. Um, the preparation of materials in multiple formats. And so always for, for each week's seminar, there's, al there's always a couple of academic papers with, with notes on um, uh, uh, potential suggested readings and um, strategies and so on, but they're always accompanied by good quality uh, podcasts, videos, TV programs, which did involve uh, some extra work in sourcing uh, those that, that map to the um, learning outcomes. And there's also um, a purposeful inclusion of neurodivergent scholars in each week's reading list. Uh, students have a choice in how they participate in class. Um, so we developed a learning contract at the start of the module. Um, it's made explicit that if students are having a listening only day, that's fine. Um, if there are discussion questions, um, they can choose to talk about it in pairs and groups or to reflect on them individually, that's fine. Um, try to incorporate a walkabout activity each week. So uh, could it include researching a topic, um, preparing a debate position in the library or anywhere else on campus that they feel comfortable within time parameters. Um, giving a choice of communication outside class, so email, module discussion forum, tutorials online, tutorials in person, and very regular opportunities to feedback um, and make suggestions or ask for particular topics to be covered. Um, the first assessment, um, really out of my comfort um, zone. So their task was to convey scientific information on neurodiversity to a non-specialist audience, uh, but um, they've done this as a creative artifact. So they choose their topic. There are some suggested topics, but they can go outside that. They choose the format, um, and that's what I really hadn't tried before. They choose the audience, um, and then they get a choice of what they would like feedback on and how they would like the feedback delivered. The format, I had no idea how this was going to go, um, but I am marking them as we speak. And uh, I had an in-person presentation, a recorded presentation. I have a couple of infographics, which look brilliant. Um, I have an entire animation, which I really didn't expect, um, alongside uh, blog posts and so on. So it's really, really, really great. It's really been creative. And then I'm going for a traditional exam with the second assessment. I'm wondering if I can take a UDL approach to this more traditional um, form of assessment. Um, so using a scaffolded preparation uh, approach, week, week by week, week building um, um, uh, exercises towards um, the their exam preparation, and also incorporating within the, the exam script to kind of build your own questions. So within, um, within parameters, they can choose the topics that they ask, ask, answer the questions about. We'll see how that goes. I don't know yet. Is it working? Uh, well, the jury's still out, but we're about two thirds of the way through the module. Um, so this is reflection only. I don't have any um, uh, concrete evidence to, to back this up. I would say in terms of um, participation engagement, absolutely. Um, the students have been brilliant. 
Um, and uh, uh, I was aware at the start of the, the course that there are three neurodivergent students in the class that their particip participation engagement has been um, phenomenal. Module evaluation has been great. The creativity in um, the assessment type has been great. Attainment, I don't know yet. And um, exam anxiety, I don't know yet. So um, we, we shall see. But just before finishing, uh, I did just want to highlight, um, I, I did ask, I've been working uh, closely with the neurodivergent students in the class um, and been very open with all of the students about the UDL approach we're taking and what, what the purpose of that is, what the rationale is, and you know, try to uh, explain how it might be different from other approaches that they um, come across in different modules. Um, so the students know what I'm trying to do. Um, and I, uh, <laughs> I um, did ask um, uh, neurodivergent students in particular for some, uh, to, to write some testimonials. So th this is completely um, unscientific and there are lots of reasons why they might be, ni might be being nice. Um, but um, I, I, hope, I hope and I think that they're genuine. So, um, so the first student um, has um, a dual diagnosis of autism and ADHD. Um, described her that described their secondary school experiences as particularly um, difficult and they've said I found it easier to contribute to discussions in this module because I don't feel pressured to contribute contribute being able to choose the format of our assessments been very helpful for me I was able to choose a creative format that I have experience with and that catches my interest more than the normal essay format the lectures include breaks partner and group discussions and often group research in the library which gives me breaks from sitting still and makes it easier to concentrate and take in more content in different ways. And that was the student who, uh, who has done a fantastic animation. The second student um, is uh, currently awaiting autism assessment. Um, uh, this is an uh, academically excellent student um, who's struggled with social and, and sensory aspects of education throughout their educational um, career. And they've said, last year, I found the lights in the lecture lectures too bright. I felt unable to ask for help within large groups, and I often struggled with fatigue resulting in me missing lectures. The structure of this module comes from a place of understanding about neurodivergent brains, which has massively helped me to feel comfortable. I get to follow what I'm interested in and complete the assignment in the best way for me, which I believe has improved the quality of my work. If I have any questions, they've been answered honestly, kindly, and with clarity. I still struggle with noises from inside and outside the building and the lights still hurt my eyes. But I know that I'm not going to be chastised or singled out for wearing my headphones or looking away from the board, which allows me to do the things I need to do to keep learning and stay engaged. So uh, that is it. Um, so I'll leave you with some final thoughts and I'd be very interested to hear your questions. So I'm currently thinking, you know, it's all very well doing all of these things in a small class with third year students. Um, I'm currently uh, thinking about how we Revalidate our undergraduate programs, and we're looking at cohorts of 300 plus students now. So, you know, how some of these techniques can be scaled up um, to much larger class sizes, and how um, these kind of approaches might be evaluated. Um, one final point I want to make is that neurodivergent students, both at school and university, can tell us about their needs, their struggles, their interests, and their experiences, and we could really listen more. I also think we need to understand more about the breadth of neurodivergent educational experiences. A lot of the literature at the moment focuses on autism, uh, mainly through the, um, the efforts of uh, autistic scholars. Uh, we know less about ADHD, DLD, dyscalculia, etc. And a final point, if I think universities should be the ideal context for neurodivergent thriving if we can reduce barriers, examine and reflect on our own implicit biases and stereotypes, avoid negative interpretation of student behaviours and work with students. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Lorna. This was um, absolutely fantastic and uh, super interesting. I uh, also really enjoyed the practical approach uh, to see it applied directly in the classroom. So that was uh, massively um, useful. We have a couple of comments and a question at the moment in the chat. Um, and uh, I think I will start with one comment from Alexander here. Um, they write, um, I assume that such flexible approach to assessment, I think this was the assessment one that you have um, described, uh, to assessment design goes with um, thought in mind that some students might need more guidance, direction, and support than others. Yeah, 100%. And this is something that, um, yeah, I was kind of aware of and worried with, uh, worried about it again. 
you know, with the proviso, this is a small class and it's easy for me to do these things. Uh, each student got a lot of tutorial time to talk through this and there was no pressure for them to go for a more or less creative um, approach. For those who didn't feel comfortable doing something uh, a little bit less traditional, um, you know, it was perfectly fine to write an, an information sheet um, in, in a more sort of traditional, uh, not academic, but um, uh, writing accessibly for a non-specialist audience style. So that, that was a fine um, option to take. And for those students who did choose more um, creative approaches, you know, they were directed to, for example, you know, um, digital support on, on, on campus for, for, for help with, with that sort of thing and, and talking through the um, the different the differences between, for example, doing an infographic and, and, and writing. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was able to, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I was in the luxury of being able to offer that level of support because of the small class size. So I know, that, I know that's not always, always the case. Mm -hmm. I think I have a, a question that is related to that specific assessment, because one thing that I thought, uh, probably two questions. One is how big was your class? Um, uh, just to contextualize the, the type of assessments. And the other one was, um, how did you decide on the criteria? Because those are probably, they could look as completely different assessments because of the flexibility and the freedom they have to put them together. So how do you merge this again with the criteria, with criteria that you use for marking? Yeah, so it's a great question. And um, I can't really tell you how successful it was yet because I'm in, in, in the middle of marking them. You know, so obviously the, the balance that you're making here is with quality. Um, uh, so, yes, um, I developed an assessment criteria, which I judge to be equally transferable about uh, um, across each um, format type. So the clarity of the information, um, the um, uh, appropriateness of the of the sources used. So they had to do a bibliography alongside showing where all of the information they sourced was from. Um, uh, there was one for creativity, although it's made clear that, you know, that could be in um, in the way that you present information in a written format, as well as um, uh, in something more obviously creative. I can't remember them all now, but I, I felt, and this is completely subjective and it's experimental, so we'll, we'll see how it works. Um, that each of the, the, the assessment criteria could be applied to each of the formats. Um, yeah, but it was, it, was, it was difficult. And, it, and, and in terms of class size, like small, small, like, you know, 15, whereas, you okay. know, we have, we have okay. class sizes of, you know, 300, so. Right, yeah. It's just always good to, to know the situational context around those kind of assessments as well. I'm always interested in that. We have a question by um, Kirsty, and I kindly asked her to, um, to add on camera, that's okay. Hi, thank you so much for this talk. It's been really interesting listening to um, the work that you've been doing. I teach at PGT level, so I appreciate there's it's there are things that are applicable and things that might be slightly distinct. And um, one of the things that has come up for me when providing multiple assessment styles is that sense of overwhelm that can um, that students can be impacted by, especially um, when they have past trauma, they're carrying like as 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 teachers were often dealing with the ghosts of of teachers past when um, and students don't trust their own instincts because they've interpreted something wrongly in the past and they've been disciplined for it or it's it's, it's resulted in a lower grade. Um, and I was just interested how do you like uh how do you approach that without being overly prescriptive in the guidance i can see already uh, liz has has given a response of providing rubrics uh and i was just trying to type my response there while listening to what your, your previous <laughs> answers and i use rubrics as well but when you've got multiple different assessments your criteria on the rubric have to be broad enough to be able to assess those and it becomes that you either narrow yourself down on the assessments or your rubric stops being meaningfully um, meaningful guidance. I was just, I was curious. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, and I don't know that I have a really incisive response for you yet. Um, I probably need to run it to the end and and and, and see. Um, I, I was expecting a huge amount of overwhelm for this. I, 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 that's what I was expecting, a load of anxiety and like, oh, we've never done this before. And, you know, can we just write an essay? And I have, I just haven't, I haven't experienced it on this module with this cohort of students could be a complete cohort effect um uh, you know could be you know uh, you know if i'm being 
to be positive to myself, you know, we have tried to take this co-creation um, approach throughout the module. So, you know, getting their input into, you know, what within the within the broader curriculum, what they want to study, you know, that that could, you know, hopefully that reduced their anxiety. I don't know. We do, yeah, we do have a, a, a quite extensive um, um, assessment brief which gives examples of each, um, you know, the types of audience and what it would be, what it would mean to be writing for parents as opposed to teachers, for example, the types of assessment with a link to an example, in, not like a, um, a previously submitted assessment, but an example to an infographic which gives information about a scientific topic, for example. Um, and I just haven't had that anxiety that I was expecting this time. But, you know, I might teach it again next year and then it will, it will be a complete nightmare and I will be panicking. So I don't want to uh, infer too much from one, one iteration. But yeah, it's a great question. Um, and lots, lots of uh, colleagues, you know, say that, you know, that when they try to introduce uh, choice, particularly at lower levels of the curriculum where, you know, um, you know, they're teaching kind of core psychology curriculum, in this case, like social psychology, and they let students choose it. it you know, the more choice, the, the more panic. Um, so, yeah, it, it is definitely a thing. Um, but I wonder if the way that we present and support that choice can be presented in a way that it is a you know a, a strength for them and, a, and an opportunity for them to play to their strengths so for example i had one one student who um has, has a, a physical issue like a, a repetitive um, strain and um she uh was really excited not you know just to have one thing where she didn't have to write and she could just do a presentation um and to, whereas a, a other student who hates presentations has had to do them and so you know so the, this batch of students seem to have, have relished the opportunity to make those kind of autonomous decisions. But like I say, want to uh, uh, extrapolate too much from that. They might just be a really great cohort. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, from David. David? Hello, Lorna. Thanks for that talk. It was really inspiring and interesting oh, um, and aligns with some stuff we want to do at Glasgow <laughs> too. But um, I, I just want to ask you about the safe spaces uh, concept that you talked about I mean is that specifically you know sensory havens of some sort or, or is there something else that you use at York um so uh it's, it's one of those really politicized uh terms now it's highly charged so you know safe, safe spaces for snowflake students and all that kind of nonsense um I'm really talking about it um in, t in terms uh of this talk a little bit more figuratively in terms of um from the compassion focused therapy um, perspective as uh, as a space within a learning community which feels safe uh, where you, you don't feel attacked and um, where you feel that you belong and you feel that you have value and that you can contribute so i'm talking mainly about the classroom spaces we do have quiet spaces but we don't unfortunately yet have um, a particular um, sensory room although i would love that if i could uh, persuade uh, estates to uh, to go with me on that um uh but yeah it, yeah, I'm using it in, in that specific sense in terms of um, trying to create a, 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 a learning community, a space within a learning community. Because I think what sometimes, you know, I, I, reflecting back on, you know, years of teaching in the past, where predominantly my, my experience of teaching neurodivergent students has been really positive. And um, there have been, you know, cases where, you know, where anxiety has really escalated and, you know, um, things haven't gone, gone so well. And I think sometimes it is it because students because they have these cumulative memories of you know feeling wrong and other in education you just get into this attack and counterattack dynamic which is really um, really unhelpful. So it's about trying to break that down and uh, use those kind of compassionate approaches to to try and build a, a more positive self image of, of themselves as a student and a learner. Um, so yeah, we don't have sensory room. I wish we did. Great, thank you. Right, um, we don't have any additional questions, I don't think, at the moment. Um, we have two comments, um, one from Kelly. Uh, I'm all for concentrate on strengths rather than weakness. It got about the differences. We are all different, um, different minds, autism is one of my passions as my grandson has this diagnosis. So I'm also learning every day. Schools need to treat all children the same and give each child the same opportunity to the own uh, ability advantages to bring the best of them. Yes. Yeah. 
yeah I, I agree and and you know just to re-emphasize there's loads of brilliant work and skills going on in this space um uh it's just not yet universal or consistent enough and mm -hmm. the same with universities and all the healthcare settings as well and i think we have one final comment by rachel um that's really nice as well i know rachel if you want to come on camera and just um say it yourself it's up to you um and it's about um i think they offered different um assessments uh, to students essay or narrated presentation but everyone pretty much went for the essay not because it was their favorite uh but just because um maybe confidence or capacity to learn how to do a narrated presentation um so that's interesting as well i guess yeah yeah so that perhaps speaks to you know trying to yeah and i don't know how to do this this is just um thinking about it because as i say i'm going to be uh, leading on revalidating our entire suite next year so and i really want to um Im improve um or increase our um it, yeah inclusive methods and and autonomy and choice and universal design all the rest of it so um it's perhaps about introducing it earlier um mm -hmm. and again just finding ways to make to make it less scary for students i don't know how to do that yet but, um, <laughs> i'm sure it can be done <laughs> yeah all right with that uh, i would like to thank you again lorna um in to join our Thai seminar with, um, with your talk and um sharing your insight and your research thank you very much and um i hope to see you all at our last um Tile seminar for this academic year in May. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Carolina. <laughs>